Welcome back. Today we're going to chat about max heart rate, give you some points to consider, tracking it, using it. Do you need to train it? Let's get stuck in. So behind me here is my performance management chart on training peaks, and it makes it really easy to track heart rate data. So what we've got, it's probably going to be a little tough for you to see what's going on here, but this is fitness history by month peak heart rate. And we've got five second, one minute, five minute, 20 minute, and 60 minute by month there. And it goes back 12 months. So it's really easy for you to see where your most sustained efforts, 20 and 60 minutes are, where your most intense efforts are five second and a minute. So previous, before last week, it was in December, and there's a 160, let's have a look, 168 there. So if you click that, it'll pop, the workout pops up, and then you click that, and it'll bring you to the workout, shrink me down again here. And then you click analyze, and then you just click this heart here and it'll let you um, see your peak stuff and it'll see for the workout it'll show you all these different peak values so it's a really quick way if you're not sure what your max was and you're just pushing all the files up you just go to that history click it workout comes up then you'll go to the workout and this type of workout is where I typically see my highest heart rate values so it was a series of nine eight hundreds and it was like one two three and then reset a bit four five six and I was descending by threes and then at the end of that workout I didn't max it out but I was running very fast and I saw this peak heart rate and at the time I knew because it was like sort of a nine out of 10 effort that if it was a race or I wanted to go harder, I'd be able to generate a higher heart rate. But a few weeks later, had an injury, backed off, and then I was starting to get into the spring, get then ultimately into the summer. And when I get into those periods of my year, it doesn't make sense for me to generate fatigue with maximal efforts because maximal efforts whether in the gym or at the track are very fatiguing and they're fatiguing often in a non-specific way and what I mean by that is if you're a multi-sport athlete or you are an athlete training for long endurance events uh, you might not necessarily need the capacity or the ability to tolerate going to a very very high heart rate. And you'll see that in my uh, fitness history. Uh, as I come into race season, I don't, you don't see these peak short duration uh, efforts anymore. What you see is the longer efforts coming up. But again, they're normally not best uh, efforts because I'm not maxing it out for 20 minutes. Last season was a season focused on Ironman racing. And it just doesn't make sense for me to get tired from short duration maximal efforts in that. And as well, in my VO2 block, that was focused on the bike. And I tend not to see, like most of you, I don't see the same peak heart rates on the bike as I do on the run. On the run, I tend to see a little bit higher, uh, depending on the kind of shape I'm in, anywhere from 5 to 10 beats higher. Another point, heart rate is only part of the equation. So there's the number of beats per minute, and then there's the blood that's moved with each beat. So something you might notice, particularly if you're new to training, is your maximal heart rate declines as you get in better shape. Well, why is that? Well, your stroke volume, the amount of blood that's going per beat, is increasing. So the heart is able to move more blood per beat. So the fact that your max heart rate is decreasing is not necessarily 
a bad thing. You might actually be, and I would argue you probably are, moving more blood per beat. And at your lower max, you're probably moving more blood as well. So that's something to keep in mind. So it's just, it's really heart rate across the whole spectrum. It's just a number and we need to interpret it in context of the environment, whether it's hot or cold, how we're feeling, what are the other factors, our velocity and these types of things. So keep that in mind. So let's, uh, so this was my typical, this is back in December. Then we go back to this chart. Now we see it's 174. And there's something interesting about this 174, at least for me. Uh, we go to analyze and then we click the heartbeat and we can see that it was 174 for a minute. So this was quite a long uh, period with my heart rate right up at max. Now this was a hot day. So I was completely wide open in terms of vasodilation, meaning everything was open. I'd been exercising for a long time. We were doing a shared bike uh, workout where, let's get me out of the way here so you can just see a bit better. So the, where you can see the numbers I'm running and where you can't see anything, I'm actually on a bike and my wife's running. And then at the end, we had a couple hills uh, which elevated the heart rate and my pace was increasing. Now, once again, this was a nine out of 10 effort at the end. It wasn't a 10 out of 10 effort, but still my heart rate was up very high for a very long time. Uh, 10 minutes at 170, which is above my prior max. Now, what I find interesting about this is uh, something that my coaches, not all my coaches, but some of my coaches felt that as we got older, it was important to regularly do maximal uh, training because there was a concern that our body might forget how to beat its heart that fast. Um, other coaches have said, eh, if you create the demand, uh, your body's gonna handle the heart rate side of it and you don't need to worry about that. But those coaches are in the minority. I would say most coaches you're gonna bump into uh, have this bias towards thinking we need a lot of maximal work. It hasn't been my experience. So what I find is we need specific work and we need specific work after we've created a very wide base with a lot of general capacity. And then we will benefit from the specific work. Does this specific work need to be maximal? Normally not because we are doing sub-maximal efforts uh, across the board. As well, you're gonna find that these maximal efforts, these true max efforts, when you actually do hit a 10 out of 10 effort are very fatiguing and they're gonna cost you recovery afterwards. And if you are in the specific preparation period for your main event, doing a maximal test that's non-specific costs you. You're only amateurs. Uh, we're probably only going to have anywhere from eight to 12 days where we're doing very specific, very challenging training in this specific prep block. And if you use one of those days to smoke yourself in a maximal test just because you're curious about the numbers, that's a day that's not available to prepare you for your race. So be real careful with this stuff. Same deal in the gym. True max work in the gym, very fatiguing. You, you want to keep that away from when you're in your race season. Uh, it's typically going to be late winter for you. All right. Now, using this maximal number uh, for training, you know, it's tempting to do heart rate zones off of max uh, heart rates. And many federations use it and you can get you can get reasonably accurate information for a novice i would argue it would probably be better just to teach them uh, how things feel and if you're a coach just run them either on a treadmill or a trainer and listen to their breathing and educate them on the shifts in breathing and there's a video on my 
channel that talks about how breathing is going to change as we go up and I actually show you what the breathing uh, signals are uh, that you can watch for. So that's going to be kind of better because as you can see, you're going to have I got. So now I've got one max. So I've got my max when I'm running 800s in Tucson in December on a cool morning. And then I've got a max when I'm doing a broken half marathon in the tropics uh, extended because I did a little bit of bike riding between some of these. That's 6K, 6K, and the final run was 9.1K. So maxes are kind of condition dependent. They're also going to be sport dependent. So your max when you're running is going to be different from your max when you're cycling. And over time, you'll find they change with your fitness levels. And this can do, sometimes it'll go down, sometimes it'll go up because you'll learn how to push yourself harder. These high intensity efforts have a learning component to, to it. And, and that, I mean mentally, it's gonna feel a certain way. And if you're not used to it, there could be a, almost a sensation of panic when the heart rate gets way up and you need to relax into it to let your body really get to these higher intensity zones. So keep that in mind for you. Now, I wanna show you something uh, else that's kind of a bit useful for you in terms of your training zones. So it comes from chapter five and it's lactate testing essentials. So if we go, uh, let's click common lactate profiles and that's going to take us here so these are the four lactate profiles you're going to see most often with athletes there's the so-called normal profile and when you run into these it's great because you can see first threshold so baseline first threshold you start going up and then there's the second threshold where all of a sudden the slope of the curve is going to change it's going to pop up and the athlete's going to, if you keep increasing the effort, the athlete's going to flame out and the test is going to end. However, the normal curve is not normal. What you're going to see in most of the population is this red line here on this linear curve. And that is as soon as we start exercising, lactate's going to be increasing and you're not going to get a clear look at this first and then this second threshold. If that's the curve you're seeing, you probably started the test too intensely. As well, you're likely testing an athlete who does all of their training too intensely. So they don't actually know or they don't actually follow their green zone. So they do a lot of tempo and a lot of harder stuff and they're probably a best average trainer. And this applies throughout the performance spectrum. It doesn't necessarily mean this is a slow athlete. So with this athlete, knowing this, finding this first threshold point, rather than using a percentage of maximum heart rate, is gonna be much more valuable for them because you can dial them down if they're willing to train that way. If they are willing to train that way, they're gonna flatten this part of the curve, this lower part of the curve, and the whole curve is gonna move down and to the right. And this maximal part of the curve might not move at all because this maximal part of the curve is pretty well trained with their current approach. But what, they're, what you're gonna find is all their sub-maximal uh, performances are gonna improve, often dramatically. So there's a few case studies in the book which are on me over an 18 month period. And I saw really great progressions from that. So if you're thinking in maximal terms, and it's common to think that a higher max heart rate is better, I would argue depends, usually not, because what will impact your fitness the most is what's happening at the first and the second threshold depending on the duration of your race. Another interesting point is that if you improve this first threshold, you're gonna find 
your time to fatigue at your second threshold is going to improve because these tests, these shorter duration maximal tests don't have the same depth, meaning they don't have the same time duration on them as a race. And you'll often find that you test great. You'll run into an athlete that tests great. Their top end looks fabulous, but their race performance isn't as good. And they can't race at the relative to the levels and the performances that you see on their hardest uh, training sessions. Now, part of that, maybe they really are a 10 out of 10 trainer and they're not saving anything for race day. But a lot of times it's because their low end isn't all that well trained. So you need to help give them comfort, bring them down and focus on this lower end type training. Now, who's the athlete that might benefit from raise the roof from a little bit or a cycle of maximal training. It's this upper right, a steep lactate curve. You're not going to run into this very often, but I've run into it with myself after periods of very high volume, ton of green zone training. I moved that first lactate threshold very close to the second lactate threshold. And then it would just go up and um, I would be done. It wasn't as dramatic as this. I made the curve in the book really dramatic so it was easy to see. But if you bump into it, it'll look like that. So the, um, the athlete is going to be able to have this really wide kind of zone one and two, relatively narrow uh, tempo zone. And then the top end zone is even more narrow and they just kind of flame out. So what the higher intensity block will do is it'll tip that curve at the top end out a bit. And you might get, ideally, you're going to get an extra step out of them. And that's going to create some, and we call it creating a little headroom above the second lactate threshold. And that's going to improve their ability to maybe do some pace changes and tolerate that higher intensity stuff. But that athlete is not going to be all that common. Uh, and you want to verify it as well. You're not going to need to be doing that absolute killer stuff year round. You're going to do blocks of it and you're going to rotate it through like we talked about in the physics of performance series. Final point. If you lose your top end and this is this is where it is useful to do some higher intensity stuff. If you, if all of a sudden you can't get your heart rate up and you fatigue very rapidly as you approach the second lactate threshold, it could be a sign that you're depleted and you have non-functional overreaching and you need to rest up, get yourself a little nutritional consulting. That is gonna look like this final curve, this flat lactate curve. And it'll appear at submax levels, you're more fit because you're generating less lactate and you'll have a lower heart rate response for a given power and pace. But the reality is you're not going to be able to get that peak heart rate, that max heart rate. And that's something where max heart rate work will show you. If you are fatigued and depleted, you, your zone five is going to feel extremely hard. It's going to see, uh, power and pace are going to be down and the actual heart rate generated is going to be down as well. And that's a sign that you're tired enough. You got to freshen up and you might be depleted. So you're going to have to consider, hmm, am I run down? Is this the reason my heart rate isn't responding? Do I need to put some more carbs into my diet, get some more energy into my body? Uh, and so bear that in mind. Okay, so I hope this helps you with interpreting max heart rate and giving it a bit of context for you. Remember, you need some other variable whenever you're looking at heart rate to put it into context for your training. How you feel and your velocity at that feeling is much more important than the number uh, that your heart rate monitor is telling you. Thanks for listening.